start that as well. Um, so, but in, in just a reminder that I do leave comments um, on it, at least some of the, the um, if it's really easy for me to see where your mistake was when you're doing the quiz, um, then I'll make a quick note like, oh, you forgot to convert from kilojoules to joules. Um, so do, and I do try to, any questions that you ask me that are not going to get answered in class, I'll, I'll write out a, an answer there too. So as a comment um, in the quiz. So don't forget to check those for feedback. Um, and with that in mind, one more thing about the quiz. Some of you may have noticed there was a typo in the quiz. There's actually a few typos in the quiz um, on one problem in particular. One of the problems said um, 2.000 with a pound space grams. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I accepted either answer if you did it properly, um, but the key, the, the auto grader answer was not correct because it also said in joules. The auto grader answer was in kilojoules and it was for pounds. So if you actually had the auto grader answer, um, you actually got it wrong. But if you got something like, like 380 kilojoule or 380 joules is the answer if you use two grams. Um, or if you used two pounds, then you got something like 170,000 joules. So either of those two answers were right, if you got your sig figs right as well. Um, if you actually put 173.2, that seems a little suspicious to me, given all the typos that were in here, that people had the exact right answer um, as the auto grader that was wrong. Um, so I'm not going to make any assumptions about that because maybe you just made the same mistakes with your calculations that I did when I was writing the problem. Um, but if you were getting the answers from somebody else who had taken the quiz ahead of you, um, you should probably not do that in the future. It looks really, really obvious that that's, or very suggestive, maybe not obvious is the wrong word, right? Um, when you get the wrong answer, it's exactly wrong as somebody else. Um, so just a reminder, that's not how the quizzes are supposed to work. Um, and just also as a reminder, when I make typos like that, don't panic, um, especially when there's something weird like pounds, grams written down. That's on me, not on you. So don't, don't worry about that. And everybody's answers um, should have gotten um, fixed when I went back through. And just a, a another... I was lenient this time, especially given all the typos, but um, be wary of over reporting sig figs, right? So if you only off, if you wrote down four sig figs and it should have been three sig figs, that's a quarter point error. That's not that big of a deal if you miss one thing. But if you wrote out 12 sig figs, if you wrote 12 decimal places and it, you were only supposed to write out three sig figs, that starts to, you're, wildly overestimating how precise your answer is at that point, right? So just a reminder, don't write down every digit that your calculator gives you because that's not, that's not the right answer. The right answer is um, to round in the appropriate spot to show where the uncertainty is, right? So just as a, a recap, and I, what I'll start doing is the more extra digits you write down that you over-report, you'll get progressively more and more um, points taken off as that happens. You're only off by one, it's a quarter point. It's not that big a deal. Let's, all right. So, so I had some interesting questions about absolute zero. Um, if absolute zero means zero atomic movement, is there such a thing as too much atomic movement? Um, well, there's definitely a point where you get too much atomic movement for bonds to actually form. When you get things hot enough, you don't actually get molecules or compounds, you just get atoms, which is essentially what happens in, in the sun um, because things are, have too much energy for electrons to actually cause molecular bonds to form. Um, but is that really too much atomic movement? Well, too much is sort of a, a judgment word, not necessarily like we're trying to say, well, it 
is anything good or bad in chemistry? Not really. Things can be wrong or right. That doesn't mean good or bad. So we try in the sciences to avoid using words like too much because that's kind of subjective. What is meant by too much? And we get more specific, like too much for compounds to exist, too much for humans to live. But it's not necessarily the same. It's just saying too much, right? So it's just kind of an interesting, the way that that was worded made me think about it for a second and thought it was worth addressing a little bit. Um, somebody was asking about uh, black holes when we're talking about temperature and things like that. Um, can we measure how much light is absorbed by a black hole? Well, black holes get a little bit interesting because normally the way we would evaluate how warm something is, if we can't physically touch it, is to measure the wavelength of light coming off of it. And you look at that wavelength of light and you can, you can estimate how hot something is based on those wavelength of light. But you can't do that with a black hole though, right? Because a black hole by definition um, doesn't emit light. So what we actually measure with black holes, we can estimate how much stuff, including light, a black hole absorbs by looking at how massive it is. And massive is just the property being of having mass. So basically the bigger a black hole, the more it's absorbed. So that's the, the easiest way to look at it is, is just in that. And so you can actually compare, okay, well, you know, things on the astronomy scale happen a lot slower than what we're used to. But if there is something like a supernova near a black hole, we can actually measure the change in the mass of the black hole um, and use that to estimate how much of the matter from the supernova got absorbed by the black hole. Um, it's just a little bit different than the way we would normally do it. And we measure the mass of the black hole by basically looking at how the orbits of things around the black hole change. So we can estimate the mass of the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way by looking at um, stars that orbit around it and what their orbits look like. We say, well, this star has this mass because it's this big and this color and it's forming this shape around the black hole. Therefore, the black hole has to have this mass. So basically get, use Newton's equations of, relative, of um, gravitation, Newton's laws of gravitation to figure out, okay, well, mass one must be this because mass two is that and the gravitational constant is this. So basically it's, it, it's almost similar in a lot of, to some of the math that we do here when it comes to like, well, we're just solving for one of the variables. As long as we can measure the other variables, we can solve for any of the others, right? Um, and as long as we're talking about temperature, somebody asked about mercury thermometers um, and phase change has to do with, with how mercury thermometers work a little bit as well. Um, and the other really common question that I get asked is when we talk about phases is most of you or some of you at least at some point have heard a glass is not really a solid or a liquid it's or it's glass is a really slow moving liquid um and it, that's not strictly speaking true but it's related to what how mercury thermometers work basically um glass is what's called an amorphous solid which means it's not a doesn't have a well-defined crystal structure and if it doesn't have a well-defined crystal structure it basically means that the atoms have some amount of randomness as to how they're positioned. And it means when you get it warm, when you get it close to where it should melt, it doesn't melt all at once the way something like ice does. Ice melts all at the same temperature, but glass just kind of gets softer as you get close to its melting point. Um, and that's because it does, because it's not a crystal structure and doesn't have that long, long distance order in it. Um, and so the properties of the phase change get a little bit weird. And you have this really wide range of temperatures where it's in the process of melting as opposed to all of it happening at one temperature. Um, so all that to say that glass is definitely a solid, it's just not a crystalline solid, which means some of the normal solid properties are a little bit different, but it's still definitely a solid. Um, one of the, the piece of evidence that my old high school teacher used to say that glass is a slow moving liquid is that if you look at all of the stained glass windows in your in cathedrals and stuff in Europe, they're thicker at the bottom than they are at the top. 
And so use that as like, well, that's, that's evidence in support of the idea. It's just a really slow moving liquid. Um, but what that take doesn't take into account is the glass making process. When you make stained glass, would you normally, and your glass is not perfectly level, perfectly flat as a skinny side and a fat side, and you're trying to balance it, would you try to balance it on the skinny side or the fat side? The fat side, right? It's gonna stand up better if you do it like that. So what they, they thought that was evidence of glass being a slow moving liquid, but really it was just an artifact of the glass process, glass making process, which is also, you know, you wanna be careful um, about drawing connections between correlation and causation. Just because things are correlated doesn't mean one thing's causing another. Um, all of that, we've gotten wildly off track already. Um, mercury thermometers work because they have a similar property to glass and that as they warm up, um, mercury atoms get further apart from each other. Most solids and liquids do this. As you increase the temperature, you get a larger distance between the molecules, which means the entire object increases in size. Um, and so mercury, mercury in particular has a really large, that's called a thermal, co thermal expansion coefficient. So in other words, mercury expands a lot for a small change in temperature, which means it's easy to make a thermometer with. You just basically say, okay, I'm gonna say this marking right here is zero Fahrenheit. And when it warms up, the mercury expands and takes up more space in your tube. And you can say, okay, well, I'm calling this temperature 100 Fahrenheit. And then mercury will just continue to fluctuate back and forth um, as the temperature changes. Really interesting fact, large bridges are not actually attached to the ground on either side because you need to account for the fact that when it gets cold, a bridge contracts by a measurable amount. I wanna say that the Golden Gate Bridge, which doesn't even have that large of a change in temperature because it's San Francisco, um, can expand or contract something like 12 feet um, over the course of, you know, over a couple of days where, where it warms up significantly. And so if you actually drive across the Golden Gate Bridge or the Bay Bridge, you'll notice it's got those metal plates on either edge, on either ends. That's so basically it slides on, sits on top of um, concrete. And when it contracts, it does this and those metal plates just get dragged along. Um, it's kind of interesting to think about. All right. Um, we're gonna talk a lot about light. So I'm gonna leave the next question for now. Um, there's a lot of questions about light and what happens with light and rainbows and why Certain things have different colors and fireworks. Um, we'll address all of those when we talk about light next week. We get into electrons and quantum mechanics. Um, and this one is sort of, I threw this on here, not because I'm gonna spend a whole lot of time talking about this, um, but just to throw out two different terms if you're interested in the more philosophical applications of science uh, in astronomy, the if you're interested in things like the Big Bang and what happened at the very beginning of the universe, that's a field um, called cosmology. So Stephen Hawking was not technically a physicist. He was a astrophysicist as well as a cosmologist because his work touched both on things that we can actually observe like black holes, but also on things like the Big Bang. Um, and if you're interested in the very, very early versions of life um, and what chemically was happening before life existed on Earth. Um, that's a field of study called abiogenesis. And, abi and there's a really fascinating Wikipedia page on abiogenesis that walks through what are the um, sort of the um, changes that have happened in our understanding of early, early life. Um, and the, the root word here is Genesis meaning beginning, bio meaning life, A meaning without. So basically it translates to um, where did life come from or life from non-life. Um, it's, a, it's a really fascinating field and it's very closely related to chemistry and biochemistry. Um, and I'm happy to discuss those things, but it's a little bit more than what we're ready for right now. So I'm gonna leave it 
And then I got three time travel questions. So I thought I'd talk about time travel to address that. Um, and actually it's related to this question because the other thing I wanna talk about with cosmology is the Big Bang is really fascinating. There's a Stephen Hawking right before he died wrote a really, really good book called Brief Answers to the Big Questions or something like that, where he addressed some of these questions that touch on his areas of expertise. Um, and one of the things that, that's really fascinating is that there, the phrase before the Big Bang doesn't actually make any sense because time didn't exist until after the Big Bang or whatever you want to call the very beginning of the universe. Um, there was a moment where the universe, as we know it, sort of came into being, but there was no before that moment because time did not exist before that moment. And so if you can't have time, you can't have cause and effect and you can't have before. Cause and effect means first one thing happens and it caused something else, right? Well, if time doesn't exist, cause and effect doesn't exist, which is a really fascinating thing to think about. Sam? Don't, they, well, don't some people also say that this Big Bang was just our Big Bang, that there's a, like a possibility that there were people before that? So there's the... So that's, and that's where it starts getting into, we're not in the realm of science anymore. And cosmology does that sometimes. Cosmology will say, well, if it worked this way, that would make the math work out, but we have no way of testing it. It's a little bit like Democritus saying, you know, talking about atoms back before they had a way to actually look at atoms, right? It's not really science at that point, it's philosophy and math. And so it's, it's similar, like, so what happened before the Big Bang? Well, that's, that's a nonsensical question because from where we are, there is no before the Big Bang. But it's basically a boundary where we can't know anything about anything that may or may not have existed before or if before even makes any sense. Um, it really messes with your head a little bit. It's one of those things that as you, you, know, you think about it while you're falling asleep, you, your brain goes really weird places when you're dreaming. Um, but the, so the, the other thing, so when it comes to time travel, which is also one of Stephen Hawking's questions that he answers in that book, um, effectively our perception of time is a really weird thing we don't really understand time or how our brain works with time why it feels like some time goes faster than other time or how relativity works why does speed affect your perception of time not just your perception of time but actually how your stopwatch works relative to somebody who's moving slower like time is weird um and but one of the one of the ways of understanding times is basically our brain's way of processing entropy, which is disorder of the universe. And that, that change in order of the universe only moves one direction. Things only, the entropy of the universe by definition only increases according to how time works in our universe as we perceive it. So if there was a time machine that could go back in time, you'd actually be violating some of the more fundamental rules of how the universe works. Um, so it's not to say that it's impossible, but it certainly doesn't seem like it because of the way our brain works, you'd actually be going to a less disordered form of the universe. And that's not how the universe works. You can't go, you can change how your time passes relative to somebody else's time, but you can't actually go backwards in time because then you'd be, it, it just, it's fundamentally not how our perception of the universe works. And so it seems very unlikely. And there are other proofs that take other approaches to it, but in general, it seems like all, the, all, all of the serious physicists in the world um, are pretty agreed on for various reasons that time travel is just not really a thing. You can't go backward in time. No, we're making real forward. We technically we are all time travelers. We just are going at a constant rate in one direction, um, which is kind of a boring form of time travel, um, but it's still time travel. Oh, I was actually talking about black holes. So, so in. So that when you get into things like interstellar and relativity, then you're starting to talk about, um, you can 
you can tweak how time passes for you relative to someone else by messing with the speed of light, not messing with it, but by getting close to the speed of light relative to somebody else, your time will pass slower than theirs. Um, and so that change, so you can move, go forward in time if you could build a spaceship where you could get close to the speed of light, like 95% the speed of light or higher, you could actually go significantly slower relative to everything. It'd still feel the same to you, but you could, if you got into a spaceship, went 99% the speed of light and then came back to earth, um, you might perceive in a year as having passed and everybody on earth would perceive that, you know, a hundred years had passed potentially. So it's in with that respect, you can time travel forward and it's really a head trip and take physics, you work out the math and where you actually have to do to do this. Um, but backwards is a different story. Sonia? Um, and, and that starts bringing consciousness into it as well, right? So in theory, time is passing the same rate for every, every type of animal but with the different metabolism or different brain synapses, brain size, um, you can you know, develop faster or slower reflexes as well. And when you bring consciousness into the perception of time, it gets even more complicated and, and harder to wrap your head around. So I was just talking about just from the physics point of view, but yes, there's certainly things where at different, even different periods of, of your life right everybody remembers feeling like a kid and feeling like it was it was felt like forever in between christmases um and now they seem like it, like we just had christmas what do you mean it's christmas again um and so now it's when you bring consciousness into it it's just a whole other thing um and that nobody really understands um because you're compounding something that nobody understands with something else nobody understands and putting them together um so that's that's a whole other thing uh, and I'll get back to things that are a little bit more relevant first. Um, but yes, good questions this week. I appreciated all of them. Um, when we're calculating sig figs with temperature conversions, do the temperature measurements count towards the sig figs? Yes. And that means with a change in temperature, you have to use your addition subtraction rules. And when you, that's going to affect things, so if you only, so today's lab, we're going to be looking at delta T for water. And water has a high specific heat relative to a lot of things. And so we might measure temperatures like, um, you know, our final temperature might be 23.1 degrees Celsius. And our initial temperature might have been 22.2 degrees Celsius. And when we do subtraction, we keep the same uncertainty, the same decimal places, right, as our least certain number, which means our delta T for these numbers is only 0 0.9 degrees Celsius, which means we went from three sig figs and three sig figs to only one sig fig. That happens with these. We're going to try to make sure that our delta T for our lab this week is at least two significant figures by making sure that our that we go up at least one degree Celsius. But otherwise, yeah, we we're very limited in how many sig figs we get to keep with these equations um, because change in temperature can be pretty small, and we don't have a great way of measuring delta t with greater precision than to the tenths place at least not in our lab there are labs that can measure a lot more accurately but um it's still not great temperature is hard to consistently measure with a lot of sig figs um so yes you can get more than to the tenths place but it's pretty uncommon both the analog thermometers and the digital thermometers we have in the lab only go to the tenths place um, and if you want more than that you're basically limited to very narrow temperature ranges if you want more than a tenth of a degree. Um, if you, because those, you know, when we're talking about how mercury thermometers work, expanding and contracting, um, they only expand linearly for a fairly short temperature range. 
if you get outside of that range, they don't expand at the same rate. In other words, your scale is going to be off. And so if you want to have more than more precision than this, you're limited to, you know, some things, some thermometers might be really accurate, but only for a five degree Celsius range. And if you're outside that range, they have no precision at all. Yeah, you can't use them. So the ones you go to the 10th place are not great, but they're better than, you know, having to switch thermometers every, every 10 minutes while you're doing an experiment because your temperature is rising. Um, can we use these equations to find the final temperature of a Slurpee? Yes. Um, you can use this to find the final temperature of anything, right? So those equations where we're solving for final temperature, we just have a system. We, need, we might need to make some assumptions like the specific heat of Slurpee syrup is the same as the specific heat of water. Um, but yeah, you can absolutely say, okay, I added this much slurry, um, this much slurpy syrup at this temperature to this much ice at this temperature. What's my final temperature? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you're also going to have to make some assumptions like no energy is lost to the surroundings, or your styrofoam slurpy cup does not absorb any of the heat. It takes zero energy to warm up the styrofoam. All of the energy is going into the into the ice, but within sig figs, you can make some of those assumptions and get a pretty good idea where things will wind up. And speaking of styrofoam insulation, why is wool a very good insulator? Does anybody know what the best insulator is for just talking about temperature? Nanotubes. Nanotubes? It's always a good guess. It seems like nanotubes get, get plugged as being pretty good at everything. Air? Air is really good. Michael? Um, basically, things lose energy when molecules run into it and bounce off, and they take away more energy than they started with. So if you think about throwing a baseball at a kid on a swing, not that I recommend doing this, but in theory, the kid on the swing is, is the high temperature sample and your baseball is a air molecule. You could slow them down by throwing <laughs> baseballs at them, right? Um, it's a funny picture, but that's basically what air does. What, and that's anytime something is losing energy to the surroundings, it's because air molecules or some molecules or something are bouncing off of it or coming away with some of the energy that your sample has. And so if you want to limit that, you want to limit how many collisions there are. So air is actually a pretty good one, a pretty good insulator. The best insulator is actually a vacuum. The best, and that's why good travel mugs, you never wash them in the dishwasher because you actually compromise the seal and you wind up with them losing their ability to insulate things because you make it so that air can leak in. And now it's not really any better than any other cup. Um, and so wool is good for that reason. It's got a lot of empty space and it limits both um, how, much, how, how much conversation there is between inside and outside, the same way styrofoam does. Styrofoam's got a bunch of trapped air molecules in it that limits how much the molecules from the air outside can hit your cold sample on the inside. Um, and so the... The other place that really makes this clear is the number one problem when it comes to temperature in outer space is not things being too cold, but things getting too hot. Because if you're generating body heat constantly in a space suit, you have to get, be able to get rid of that. And if there's no air molecules out there to bounce off of you and take some of that away, you overheat very, very quickly. So it's actually the biggest problem is getting rid of heat in space, not staying warm. So let's talk about the phase change. Um, we've talked a little bit about phase change, but so for the most part, when it comes to energy, we've mostly been talking about temperature change. And phase change is a whole different thing. We talked about it a little kind of qualitatively the other day um, from the lecture where we don't have video because the computer wasn't working. Um, 
But when we talk about going from one phase to another phase, that's something that we all have some experience with, but sometimes it can still behave sort of counterintuitively. Um, so if you're going to go from one phase to another phase, you have to, your energy has to change hands in some way. Basically, there is the reason that a liquid is a liquid is because there's some attractive force between the molecules that's kind of holding everything together. So if you want to take that liquid and you want to turn it to a gas, you have to put in enough energy to break all those molecules apart from each other. Even if it doesn't change temperature, you have to put energy in to do that. And so same thing goes when you're going from a solid to a liquid. If you're going from a solid to a liquid, a liquid has more movement between the molecules. You have to put energy into the, the solid in order for those atoms to have enough movement that they can move around each other. So, and so this figure is mostly just looking at um, it's a way of, of giving some terms, um, the scientific terms for um, for a lot of phase changes. And some of them are really obvious. The ones that you have the most experience with are um, melting and freezing. Um, and there is a more technical term than melting and freezing. Uh, melting and freezing are referred to as fusion. But that's a tricky term to use because it's not nuclear fusion. We're talking about phase change fusion, which is a different thing. So melting and freezing work per perfectly well. Um, but a lot of times the energy associated with it, you see it written as, um, you see it written like this. So the same way that I was, if there's an energy associated with, changing phases, that's something we can measure. Just like if there's an energy associated with changing temperature, we can measure it. So the energy associated with melting ice means that, okay, for every one gram of ice that melts, you have to put in 334 joules. So this is actually why ice is such a good way to keep a drink at a certain temperature is because it will stay at the certain at the same temperature until all the ice is done melting. Basically, it'll keep sucking in extra energy from the surroundings, and all that extra energy goes to turning solid ice into liquid water. And while it's doing that, it stays at the same temperature. Once all your ice is melted, then any extra energy goes to changing temperature and you go back to Q equals mass times CP times delta T. But while you're going through a phase change, everything stays the same temperature. Matt, did you have a question? Okay. So some of the other terms that you might not be as much, so evaporation or vaporization, um, you have to put energy in to go from a liquid to a gas. Condensation is the opposite. When something goes from a gas to a liquid, it releases heat. And that's the, that's the part that's a little bit weird to think about this counterintuitive. It makes sense when you say, okay, well, to melt ice, I have to add energy to it, right? But that means that when something freezes, it gives away energy, which is weird, right? So it's important to remember that these things, these opposite processes that are happening, have opposite energies associated with them too. If it takes energy to evaporate something, it gives away energy when it condenses. That's how, that's how a refrigeration works, basically. A refrigerator works by taking energy from inside and using it to evaporate Freon, which is then moved to the outside, and then it's allowed to recondense, which basically has the net effect of taking energy from inside and moving it to outside. Uh, it's so, and again, it seems weird. Another example of, of evaporation, cooling things down is sweat. Or if you go, if you get out of the shower and your hair's still wet and you go outside when it's cold outside, you feel even colder than normal, right? Because all that, all of that, um, water in your hair 
is going to evaporate and it takes the energy from your scalp when it does that it takes heat away from your scalp to evaporate. And that also means that condensation does the opposite. So in classic example is a ice cold pan that you take out of the refrigerator and you set it down and condensation happens right. That drink is not just warming up because it's got these those air molecules bouncing into it like we talked about it's also warming up because water from the air is going from a gas to a liquid on the surface of your container. And that gives away energy to the surroundings. Um, the other two that you may not have heard as much about are sublimation and deposition. We actually have these happen fairly often up here at altitude. Um, sublimation is when something goes straight from a solid to a gas. It basically skips the liquid phase. Under the right conditions, you don't actually have liquid forming. You, get, you have it just go straight from being a solid to a gas. Um, and that's that's what we see if you've ever noticed having ice on your driveway up here and it never gets above freezing all day, but there's less ice at night in the evening than there was earlier when you left in the morning. It's because it's sublimed away it's, or sub sublimated away um, and went straight from a solid to a gas. And then the opposite is deposition. When you deposit a gas, and it turns into straight into ice. So basically deposition is the difference between hail and snow. If you have rain falling that then freezes on its way down, it makes hail. But if you have it form a ice crystal straight from being a gas in the upper atmosphere, you get snowflakes. Right? And so these the other way we see deposition is in frost. So up here, we are actually at a perfect, a perfect system to be able to tell the difference here because everybody knows there's a very big difference between when it rains on the ground and then it freezes overnight. It's very different than frost, right? So that diff, or even if you have dew forming and then it gets cold and freezes, it behaves very differently on your windshield. It looks very differently than if you just have frost forming on your windshield. And that's the difference between condensation and then freezing versus deposition. And so mainly the main thing that we wanna look at on this, on this chart is the vocabulary associated with this, but then just the idea that when you go from one phase to another, it takes energy. You're either giving energy to the surroundings or taking energy from the surroundings. Let's see. So, and then they, the energy associated with each of them is known as the heat, heat of fusion. Sometimes you hear it called latent heat. Um, heat of fusion, heat of vaporization, heat of sublimation. And that's all has to do with how much energy does it take to go through these phase changes. It has nothing to do with a change in temperature. So basically, we have two different processes that can happen when things are when energy is changing hands. We can have a change in temperature, or we can have a change in phase, and they behave dis differently. When something is going through a change in phase, it will not change temperature. It stays the same temperature as long as it's going through that phase change. And that's making a couple assumptions, like everything's perfectly well mixed, for instance. Um, but it's a pretty good assumption usually. It also means, if you notice the units on our heat of, um, heat of fusion, so this delta H, delta H is known as change in enthalpy. which if you go further in science, they'll, they'll define what makes enthalpy different than just saying energy. But enthalpy is essentially the, the energy in chemical bonds. 
And so when you change phases, you change how much energy is in the chemical bonds because you're breaking some of those chemical bonds or you're making new chemical bonds. Um, that's beside the point for now. The main thing is that we can say, okay, we have a change in energy for the system based on a phase change. And what do those units suggest? If it's joules per gram, what does that mean? One unit of, I mean, it would be one unit per, of joule equals one gram, right? Like, Close. Like, You're on the right track. So it's Say that unit out loud to yourself or to all of us. What is that? How would you say that unit? Joules per gram, right? Energy per gram. And what does per mean? For every. Right, so this means one gram of water is requires 334 joules of energy. And so we need a little bit more information to know what's exactly happening here, where this is the heat of fusion. So we're talking about ice being converted to liquid water or liquid water being converted to ice. But that means we can use this as a conversion. When you go through a phase change, if you know how much you have, how much of that substance you have, figuring out how much energy it's gonna take is as easy as doing a conversion. So if we have 15 grams of ice and we added that to a glass of water, how much energy is it gonna to take to convert all of the ice to water? And how did you get there? I meant which numbers did you multiply? But 15 grams of ice. And for every one gram of ice requires 334 joules. And what did you say it was? So 5.01 times 33 joules. So it's really that easy. It's easy, even easier for phase change than it is for temperature change, right? Temperature change, we need to know the mass, but we also know, need to know the specific heat. Here we need to know the mass. And we need to know this number, which is going to be different for every substance. Every substance is going to have its own delta H effusion, which is why different things is one of the reasons why different substances freeze at different temperatures. Part of that is because every substance has its own delta H effusion. The other thing to keep in mind here is that because there's no temperature change, there's no negative sign anywhere in here, right? And so we need to pay attention to is energy being absorbed or released to the surroundings? Because this 334 joules, it doesn't matter if we're talking about water turning into ice or ice turning into water. It's gonna be the same energy, but it's either gonna be absorbed or given off. For the surroundings. So we just need to think about it, the process to know whether or not this is energy absorbed by the ice or energy released by water freezing. Right. And so that's where this figure is kind of handy. We're going from solid ice to liquid water, which means the solid ice has to absorb 5,000 joules of energy from the surroundings to get there, to become melted. And so for this class, especially negative signs on energy get kind of tricky, but you can kind of always get around that by using qualitative words like absorbed or released. I'm not going to be super, super picky about did you put a negative sign or not on an energy 
Because if you didn't put a negative sign, but you did say absorbed or released, that's just as good as far as I'm concerned. Not until you get to physics where that starts really, really mattering whether or not you kept that negative sign or not. All right, that this also means we can start doing some trickier questions. Like, okay, well, let's talk about this 15 grams of ice. If the water started, it has 150 grams of the room temperature water of the warmer water, and it was at 60 Fahrenheit, what's the final temperature when all the ice melts? That's a little bit trickier, right? But also not really, because what did we just get? We just solved for 5.01 times 10 to the three joules absorbed by the ice, right? And where did those joules come from? The ice absorbed it. It came from the water. So think think about the the logic of or the like in the real world. If you take a ice cube and you put it in warm water, your water gets colder. Your ice cube melts, right? The energy to melt the ice came from your water. So that means we can say that Q is five point oh one times ten to the three. Right. And now we're just really putting together two problems that we already know how to do to solve for our delta T. So if the water, if the warm water lost 5,000 joules, is Q positive or negative for the temperature change? Negative, right? So we can just say, okay, well, 5.01 times 10 to the three joules is equal to our mass of the warm water times the specific heat, which is a constant for water, times delta T. So what mass are we going to plug in there? 150? Would it be 165? That's a real question. Not, I'm not trying to lead you, but there's two masses in this problem, right? Yeah. How do we know which mass to use? The one that's given in the problem. That's never a bad approach. The one that's changing temperature. We're not talking about the, the ice changing temperature, right? We're talking about the 150 grams of warm water changing temperature. So we're going to use 150 grams for our mass because that's what's changing temperature. Our ice is not changing temperature as far as we're concerned. So we're going to plug 150 in there. Specific heat's known. Uh, one of the other common places on the quiz that people, people ran into issues was on the fourth problem, the, the last problem before the question, random questions, um, was you were given a number in kilojoules. If you didn't convert that to joules, you round up, wound up with a really, really small delta T. So if you did that, if you got a really small delta T, that's probably why. You probably forgot to convert from kilojoules to joules. In this case, we're already in joules, so it's not an issue, but something worth remembering. So what do we get for delta T? 
or if you prefer, you can do your algebra when everything is still a variable before you do any substitution. You know, should, should still get the same answer as long as you follow all your rules for algebra. So you could solve for delta T and say delta T is equal to Q over mass times specific heat. And then plug in your numbers if you wanted. Either way, we should get delta T of negative What is it? Number, number, number. Something around 50 divided by something like eight and a half, maybe? So it seems like it's a long way to get there, to get all the way from 15 grams of ice melts, what's your final temperature? But it's just, it's a, and it is kind of tricky, but it's a series of small math steps that none of those individually are that hard. Putting them together takes a little bit of practice before you can see the logic. And you might have to do some unit conversions. But once we have delta T, at the very least, we can put a, I'm just gonna make that decimal point easier to see. Um, we can put a number to, okay, after all of the ice melts, the water has lost about eight degrees Celsius. Which seems reasonable. You know, might not know exactly what 15 grams of ice looks like, but you, you know, I don't know, maybe something about the size of your thumb-ish. It's definitely between, you know, the size of a, the head of a pin and a baseball. When you think about putting that into a glass of water, this around room temperature, it's gonna cool down. It's not gonna get all the way down to, to freezing though, right? So this seems like a reasonable number. If we wanna know final temperature, so remember delta T is equal to T final minus T initial. And I was being a bit mean and giving you your starting temperature in Fahrenheit. So that's one extra conversion you have to do and it's not an easy conversion, but it's still just a conversion to get from 60 Fahrenheit to, to a temperature in Celsius, right? Did anybody do that one yet? Sixteen. So sixteen point what? Sixteen point oh. I don't know why that was behaving funny. Huh. Um. So. We'll just do that. So delta T minus 7.98, T initial 16.0 degrees Celsius. So negative 7.98 is our delta T is equal to T final minus T initial 16.0. So our final temperature in Celsius is just going to be eight point zero degrees Celsius. So Jose, you probably didn't think that we we're going to actually solve your slurpy question, huh? But this is basically what this is, right? You got ice. How much is the ice going to melt? What's our final temperature going to be? It makes things a little bit more complicated if it's syrup instead of water, but not really. We just have a different specific heat maybe for the syrup compared to water. 
All right, let's take a break and we'll come back and talk some more about phase change and do some more practice. Let's come back at 10 after. What's your question, right, Jose? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Negative twenty. So I did this and divided, and then I got seventy nine point eight, but you got seven point eight. So what did I do wrong? Is it six big ways? Um, I think you just didn't, you did five divided by 600, and this is really 5,000 divided by 600. It's five times 10 to the three. Right. So the times 10 to the three doesn't just add three zeros to the end, it moves the decimal place three spots. So when I put it in my calculator, that should have been here? Yeah. Uh, no, three one, spots. Two, three. So 5,010. So like that, and then what gave me the seven point nine. It should. Because this number looks right. Yeah, and I still got eight. Point eight. My guess is that, that you just that it just got thing. plugged in, okay. plugged in incorrectly because five five thousand one or five thousand and ten over six hundred six six twenty seven six twenty eight. That should give me a number. It's, it's definitely not 80 uh, times okay. bigger, right? So right. probably just when you plugged it in, maybe you put 62.8 instead yeah. of 628. So you just slipped the decimal, it's easy to do. Yeah, but. Well, so, and it does mess mess with you. So one of the places to watch out for that is, yeah. is here, but, all, and also just knowing in your head, okay, well, 5,000 divided by 600, that's a lot like 50 divided by six, right? And 50 divided by six should be something between eight, eight and nine ish. Like, so that kind of gives you an idea ahead of time. Well, I know that 79.8 can't be right because 50 divided by six is not 80. Right. So, kind of having that a little, trying to get just really roughly to have some mental I arithmetic. Think I saw this 60 degrees oh. that this 80 would make sense. Okay. So, I would yeah. Easy to do. Okay. Right. Becky. Uh, just wondering about this one. Yes, so that was the right answer. Negative. So, like I said, I'm not going to be that picky when it comes to negatives, especially since we hadn't talked about this in that much detail yet. Um, so, if we're talking about the iron lost that much energy. So, mm -hmm. iron should have been negative 173,000, and then the water would have gained that energy, mm -hmm. and so you could. Put a positive sign for the water, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, so it's the wording. the wording is really what I was looking for, and that's why in the question I said how much energy was lost by the iron. Because so then it doesn't really matter what the negative sign is. Yes. Um, but but I didn't mark any anybody down either way for this one. Um, but and we'll get more practice with that negative sign in lab this week. Should we know what the answer is? So either, so I'm, and I was messing, I was playing around with the auto grader to see if this auto grader way would work better. I don't like it as much. So we'll, so keep, keep it with scientific notation. It'll probably just be a fill in the blank. And so yeah. it won't, it won't try to correct your, what you plug in next time. Yeah, so I, it behaves funny when it does that. Nice, yeah. So. Um, yeah. From here on out, scientific notation will always work. Or okay. I'll, I'll try to make sure it always works. Okay. Thank you. No problem. It's a good question. I have to get into my email to look those up. So give me one second. 
I know it was Friday afternoon, or sorry, it was Thursday afternoon and Friday morning, but the specific hours, just give me a sec and I'll, I'll pull those up. It is radiation. So what we think of as nuclear radiation is actually not radiation. So, or some of it is. When something glows because it's radioactive, that's radiation. But technically, electromagnetic radiation is light. It looks like um, and it's just when you get into when you get into fission reactions, the light is a byproduct usually of a nucleus breaking up into smaller pieces. And sometimes that fires other forms of radiation like neutrons or alpha particles. Um, and those other forms of, of radiation aren't technically radiation because they're not light. But because they were discovered at the same time and, and Marie Curie was, didn't differentiate but use two different words. We have radiation to mean both of them, but in its most strict sense, radiation means light. Oh, no, I was talking about lead. You're talking about what? Lead. Oh, lead. So what does it do to block radiation? Yeah, does it block or absorb? Um, a little bit of all of them. Mostly it absorbs it, but it also will reflect some of it. And both of those are the two forms that it blocking is a combination. Some of it gets absorbed and some of it gets reflected. Sorry, I mis misheard you. Yes, light is light is radiation. Lead is basically anything really dense works to block radiation. And some forms of radiation, a piece of paper is enough to block it. <laughs> Okay. And not uh, just the normal. I mean, you eventually did that. So, some somebody asked me a question about: Is it okay to do your algebra before you plug in your numbers before? So I was just sort of answering that at the same time. If you wanted to rearrange the equation before you plug your numbers, that's fine. You can say q, you know. Q equals M C P delta T. You can plug in all your numbers except for delta T and then do the algebra, or you can do the algebra and then plug in your numbers. <laughs> That's all I'm showing you that was. Never said it was. Um, <laughs> by mass times specific E. Those cancel out. Square root of T equals Q over mass times CP. Thank <laughs> you. 
So you would not. So the delta t was what we were solving for. Uh, so we didn't know that that for t final. So we didn't know that we were solving for all this combined. As go. So. This is the figure. So if you want to write this down, Cody is in the yellow, Ricky is in the orange. Um, and I, this is, these are the subject tutors, meaning for specific subjects other than just generic math or generic writing. Um, there's also a math tutor named Brad, who's taken all the chemistry courses here, who's around a lot. Um, and, but he's not officially being paid to tutor in chemistry. He can at least point you in the right direction, but his, you know, he hasn't taken this class in a long time. Um, but if, so Monday, Monday, Wednesday, three to five is Cody. Rigney is two to six on Thursday afternoon or 10 to 12 on Friday mornings. Um, and Again, this is subject to this is a, a work schedule, right? For, for these tutors. So if they need to change their tutoring schedule, it might shift a little bit, but this is what we're starting off the quarter as. And and um, I'll communicate with you if I hear that there's going to be any change here. And Brad in the green here, Bradley, um, has a lot of hours. And again, he's not being paid to be a chemistry tutor. So if there's somebody asking a question about a math course, he has to, to give them precedent. But if he's just sitting in there doing nothing and you come to him with a, with a chemistry problem, he's a really good resource too and because he's got a lot more hours, right? So almost any hours that the library is open, you can probably find Brad there. Um, he's a taller guy with long, uh, at least he had longer hair with uh, big glasses. Um, and he's a, he's a really good resource for anything in math as well. So Brad, Cody, Rigney are your tutors. And then in addition, you've got my office hours as well, um, which are Monday, Wednesday, 9.30, 10 to 11, or Tuesday, Thursday, 10.30 to 11.30, or just anytime you see me. If I'm around, those are the hours that I'm guaranteed to be in my office. Um, well, at least on campus and available to you. I might be wandering around um, taking care of other stuff on campus, but if you hang out by my office, you'll catch me pretty quickly. Um, but if, I'm, if you see me walking through, through the commons downstairs and grab me and ask me a question, that's totally allowed too. I might just tell you I'm on my way to a meeting. I can't, can't stop right now, um, but feel free to, to just get my attention and ask then there too, right? Um, and those hours are on my, my weekly schedule that's posted on Canvas too. So you don't need, you know, you can check that as well for, for office hours. All right. So let's talk a little bit more about phase change because phase change behaves in kind of a funny way. And it's a little counterintuitive 
um, that when a phase change is happening, the temperature stays constant for whatever is going through that phase change. So it doesn't mean the whole system is at the same temperature necessarily, but it, at the very least, whatever chunk of it is going through, through a phase change is going to be that same temperature. So if you think about our example of ice melting in a drink, if you don't stir that and you just let it sit there, your ice is gonna be melting at the top. The section at the bottom might have, um, might actually be warming up faster than your ice is melting at the top. The section at the top should all be the same temperature, but you could wind up with, if it's not well mixed, you could wind up with sections that are locally warmer than, than the ice melting. Um, which is why you should always just go with the restaurant style, fill up your glass with ice and then add your drink to it. And then you don't have run into that problem. Um, and so a lot of times we're just gonna make the assumption Usually when I decide make the determination whether I need to talk to it, I still make the point that I'm trying to get here and then was there something clear that I see? She just need to know All right. So, no, they're just doing their jobs. I don't like it until I can't work on my project until somebody else is done with theirs. So I'll assume that they don't like being told today have to wait too. Um, when we have a, a phase change happening, we can create what's, this is what's called a cooling curve, sometimes called a heating curve. For whatever reason, they use the two terms equivalently. Um, I, and it, basically all it is, is it's a, a graph where you have your temperature of your system versus either heat added or heat removed. And so what you see is that you have a, a couple distinct sections where if you start with steam at 140 Celsius, for instance, as you start removing, as you start removing energy, you get this first section where the temperature is changing. And then you hit a phase change. And that phase change everything stays the same temperature. And then once all of the steam is condensed, if you keep removing energy from it, the temperature starts changing again until you get down to the point where you hit another phase change. And so basically we can actually watch this happen. Um, it usually makes more sense to start with ice and you watch the temperature of the ice as it warms up you'll see temperature changes and then it hits the point where the ice starts melting and then temperature flattens out for a while. And then once all the ice is melted, temperature starts going up again until you get to boiling. So this is the other reason why boiling is such a common way of cooking things is it's a way of making sure that you're keeping something at a constant temperature for a set amount of time. If you just tried to heat up pasta, even if you started with fresh pasta that didn't need water added to it, if you just threw that pasta onto a flat top and tried to cook it, it's not going to cook very evenly, right? You're going to scorch part of it and part of it's going to be raw. You put it in boiling water though, and now you, everything stays at the same temperature because as long as that water is boiling, it's at 100 Celsius or close to it since we're at altitude. So this allows us this all this graph is is it basically allows us to to chunk up this process and turn it into things we know how to do the math for 
Because if you know that you're starting with a gas and you're going to cool it down, at some point it's going to hit a phase change, right? And we know how to figure out how much energy is required for when something's changing temperature because you use the Q equals mass times specific heat times delta T. And the specific heat is essentially the slope of that line. How much energy does it take to change the temperature? Well, that's basically rise over run, right? And then you hit a, a, temp, a phase change and we can say, well, the energy for that phase change, we just did that with a second ago, just like a conversion, right? We use delta H of uh, this would be delta H of vaporization. And then you're back to using our Q equation again. And so this means that we can basically figure out the amount of energy that it takes to get to any point here if we know where we started and we know what temperature the phase changes are at. We might have to look some stuff up like specific heats or the energy of those phase changes. But this is basically your roadmap for any time we've got temperature changing or energy going into a system or coming out of a system, we can figure out what's going to happen based on where do we start here and are we adding energy or taking away energy? We're just going to break it up into chunks and we can figure out the energy of each chunk pretty easily. Uh, it also allows us to figure out where phase changes happen. If we had some unknown liquid and we just started with it at room temperature and we just kept dropping the temperature until the temperature stayed constant for a while, we know that that's the point where it's freezing. Or if you start with your unknown liquid and you heat it up and measure the temperature, at some point your temperature starts staying constant. That's when you hit the boiling point. Right, so we can actually make these graphs. It's kind of a boring lab, to be perfectly honest, because you're literally watching ice melt um, and then water boil and then taking data while you're doing it. But it's making these graphs is kind of, it's kind of satisfying though, because you get lots of data, plug it into a chart in Excel and you get this nice graph that looks just like this. Except instead of heat removed or heat added, we basically have time that it sat on, on a hot plate. So let's do some practice with this. Let's say we take a 25 gram piece of ice out of a freezer. The average residential freezer is usually close to zero Fahrenheit or somewhere between um, negative 15 and negative 30 Celsius. How much energy does it take to change the temperature of that 25 grams of ice up to zero Celsius? What equation do we need to use for this one? I did you the, gave you the um, favor of having written it out for you. But anytime a temperature is changing, you're using that equation. That's the only equation you know with delta T in it, right? So if there's a change in temperature, you're using this equation. So this is pretty straightforward, right? If we're just looking for Q, 25.0 grams, the specific heat of ice is not the same as the specific heat of water. So we have a different CP than normal, but it's given to us. And what's delta T? 23. We started at negative 23 and we're going to zero where it's gonna start melting. So if we wanted to plug it in as final minus initial, our final is zero Celsius minus our initial, which is negative 23 Celsius. 
in other words, plus 23. Neo, do you have a number? All right, that seems reasonable, right? That's in the same ballpark as numbers that we've been getting for, for Q. 25 times two is 50 times 23. Yeah, right around a thousand makes sense. How much energy is it going to take? Let me clear this up. How, how much energy does it take to melt the 25 grams of ice? If we know this about ice. Well, we have 25.0 grams and every one gram takes 334 joules. You could say joules absorbed if you wanted to, since we're talking about melting. Something like 8,000? So phase change, once you know it's a phase change, Phase change is pretty easy to get an energy for. And you go. So I think I slipped the dead 25 times 300. 25 times four is 100. So it's probably not going to be 8,000, 80,000 makes more sense to me. Um, but I'm also doing mental arithmetic. So did I slip a decimal place? Is it 8,000 or 80,000? 8,000. Sorry. I was right the first time. So then yes, it would be times 10 to the third. Which if you look at those two numbers, it's kind of interesting. It takes about eight times as much energy to melt the ice as it does to warm the ice up to melting. Which is one of the reasons why ice is so good and keeping drinks cold, right? It takes a long time for ice to melt. It's capable of bringing down the temperature of a lot of liquid before it's all the way done melting. And let's say we continued this. We said, okay, well then how much is it gonna to take to bring that ice from that water once it's done melting? from zero Celsius to 21 Celsius. So we had Q equals, now we're back to using 4.184, but other than that, nothing changed, right? And what's our delta T? Just 21. We get, should get something like 2000. Somewhere between two and three thousand, probably. What is it? Two thousand two hundred. And again, that's a much smaller number than the phase change, right? So, anybody's ever been 
ever tried or been gifted those like you know rocks that you can put in your freezer to make them cold and then you can put them in a put in a drink so you don't water your drink down those don't really work right because there's no phase change all you're doing is taking cold rocks and making them warm rocks but because there's no phase change they don't work as well as actually using ice the phase change is actually the bulk of the energy when it comes to bringing something up to temperature. And that's why when you take a pot of water, it might take 10 minutes to bring it up to boiling, but then that same pot of water will sit there and it will, it'll take you an hour before it, if you boil, tried to boil off all of the water, it would take an hour, right? And it only took 10 minutes to get it up to boiling because the phase change takes more time and more energy than the um, then the temperature change. Sam? Talking about like transfer, I guess you say you could be forcing the person like that. So things, if you put something hot with something cold, they will try to even out the temperature. So basically, and that's basically just statistics. It's a law of average. If you have something where you've got a bunch, think about taking, um, I'll go back to my a moving box full of ping pong balls example. If you take a moving box full of ping pong balls and they're all moving really, really fast and you put it into it and then you put a bunch of ping pong balls that are moving slower in the same container, eventually they're all gonna be going the same speed on average, right? Because those molecules are gonna bump, the fast moving molecules are gonna bump into the slow moving molecules and transfer some energy. And so eventually everything averages out to the same amount of average kinetic energy over time. And that's why everything eventually averages out to the same temperature if you give it enough time. If you keep it isolated, then you can get things, it takes a lot longer, but even with a really good thermos, your hot coffee eventually gets cold, right? Because even if you slow that process down, eventually everything turns to being the same temperature. All right, so let's draw drawing one of these heating curves. So the other thing, the other point I'm trying to make with this problem is we just solved for three different chunks of the heating curve, right? We started at negative 23 Celsius, we warmed it up, got to a phase change, then we measured how much energy it would take to go through the phase change, and then we let it keep warming up again, right? That's we started here and ended right there. We solved for three different chunks here. That was part one, that was part two, that was part three. So a heating curve just gives us a good way to break things up so we know what math we have to do. If I give you a more point blank question like, you start with ice at negative 23 Celsius, how much energy does it take to warm up to water at 50 Celsius? That's three math problems, not just one. Because you, and you know that if you start by drawing a heating curve, right? So that's what we're gonna do is, okay, let's draw the heating curve for the process we just did the math for. If I don't break it up for you, I still want you to be able to look at this and say, okay, what is that heating curve going to look like? Well, qualitatively means I don't really care that you get the size or the slope exactly right. All that really matters is as you're adding energy in, you're starting at negative 23 Celsius. And your temperature goes up and then you hit zero Celsius. When you hit zero Celsius, what happens? It melts. So then your temperature goes flat for a bit. You keep adding in more energy, but no temperature change. And then once all the ice is melted, it goes up again, right? So if we want to know the total amount of energy for this process, we just add up all the pieces. And a lot of times I just, I delineate them or I, I um, indicate them by just saying, okay, we'll call that Q1 
call that Q2 and I'll call that Q3. I just get three different Q values. That's just what we did on the last slide. All you really need to know is where does it go through that phase change? Where do I hit a temperature or a phase change? And where is it just using a delta T equation? So our total Q for this process is just Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3. So the total process is complicated-ish, but every step along the way is easy if you know what it is, right? Like mind-numbingly easy math and algebra to find Q if you know that it's a temperature change or if you know it's a phase change. It's only tricky when I give you a point blank, this is where you start, this is where you end, how much energy does it take? Because you have to start with something like this. Questions before I erase this. If I ever say draw a heating curve or what heating curve matches this system, this is all I'm looking for, the part that I have circled. You don't even need Q1, Q2, Q3 if I just say draw a heating curve. Just generally speaking, what temperature did it start? What temperature does it go through a phase change? What temperature does it end? That's it. And if we wanted to, which we're gonna skip this one for now because we just did this with very, very slightly different numbers. If ice has a mass of 35 grams, how much energy is required to change the ice from negative 23 to liquid water at 22 Celsius? And there's just a missing or an extra space in there. So the negative sign got separated from the 23. Literally what we just did with 35 for the mass instead of 30, instead of 25, your final temperature is a little different, right? Here's another way I can ask this question, ask a question about this. At Lake Tahoe's elevation, water boils around 94 Celsius. A sample of ice at zero Celsius is heated until it melts and becomes steam at 94 Celsius. Which heating curve matches that description? So you're starting with ice at zero Celsius and it's heated until it becomes steam at 94 Celsius. C, what's wrong with B? It kept going. After all of your water was became steam, the temperature kept going up and that's not what's described up there, right? So C has two phase changes in one second where it's changing temperature. Starts at ice at zero Celsius. And then once it melts, temperature goes up until it's 94 Celsius where the temperature stays constant again, right? So where it's flat on a heating curve is a phase change. And where you've got a slope, that's where you've got a temperature change. Let's figure, let's say that the sample of ice has a starting mass of Let's make it a bigger number this time. Let's say it's got uh, 82.5 grams. And CP for water, we know, but I'll put it up here again anyway. Delta H fusion, we've used a little bit, but I don't expect you to have these memorized. 
and delta H of vaporization in these units is gonna be We'll go to good old Google. Khan Academy. Okay, we'll call it 540 to two sig figs. That's calories. Multiply that by four. Let's call it. <coughs> Call it uh, 2,000, that works. So how much energy is it gonna to take to do that whole process? Ice at zero Celsius, all the way to steam at 94 Celsius. You want to know what this is. So I'm starting by just labeling what my different sections are going to be. And correspond to the three different sections on this graph here, right? Start with a phase change, water of the ice melting, then a temperature change where you go from zero Celsius to 94 Celsius. And then you get water boiling. So the Q1. But we just need, we're just using that heat of fusion. You can say, okay, well, 82.5 grams of ice, and every one gram of ice requires 334 joules of energy. That gets our energy for Q1. What are we going to do for Q2? We're going to use that change in temperature equation. Exactly. It says temperature change right here. Anytime you've got a temperature change, you're using the same equation. So, mass specific E delta T. So, 82.5 grams times 4.184 because it's water. Times what's the delta T going to be? 94. Where where the phase change stopped at zero Celsius to where the next phase change starts at 94 Celsius. And then we just get to another phase change again, right? You yeah, haven't done any math with vaporization, but there's no reason it's any different. It's just a different number. If you have one gram of water, it takes 2,120 joules to boil it, to boil it all the way out, all the way to a vapor. So if we have 82, 25 grams, and one gram is 2,120 joules. get a number something like 160,000 
So if you want the total energy, you just you just get all the pieces, add them up. Just because it's something abstract like joules doesn't change the fact that you want the total, you add the pieces. A lot of times, the trickiest thing in science and in um, math is it's not actually doing the math, it's realizing that a simple idea applies to a complicated system. In this case, add up pieces. So, Q1 is going to give us what do we get for a number? And how about Q2? Thank you. And once again, look at the relative magnitude here. It takes almost as much energy just to melt the ice as it does to take the energy, the ice, all the way off to the boiling point. When you think, think about taking a chunk of ice and putting it into a pan on the stove, that kind of makes sense. It takes about as long on the stove to bring to melt the ice as it does to bring the ice all the way up to boiling. And right, so these phase change, these energy change problems. I can get a little bit more creative. If you take Gen Chem, then we'll do ones where we say, do things like you take a, a piece of hot copper and you add it to at, that starts at this temperature and you add it to water at this temperature. What's the final temperature of the whole system? It's really the same thing as what we're doing here. It's just getting a little bit more clever with the algebra. Right? This is the basis for pretty much anything where you've got temperature and energy changing hands. And we'll stop there. So we're not getting into new topics today. Um, in lab, all we're doing is measuring specific heat of a metal, right? So we just get more practice with this.